Hi there and welcome to the next chapter in our B1 Craft Distilling Business course where we're going to look at distillery design. Now this is where we start turning your dream or your um, image or your, your concept, whatever you have in your head, your idea, turning that into reality. Now there's quite a lot that has to go into distillery design. There's a lot that we have to consider from our side as, your, as a supplier um, in terms of equipment and layout and services and so forth. But there's also a lot of input that you're going to have to make. Um, a lot of things that you have to think about, things that we have to discuss, things that you might need to discuss with your interior designer or your architect or depending on what you want to accomplish there. A lot of thought needs to be put on this. It's not as simple as just getting a warehouse, putting in a, um, electricity, water, uh, setting up the equipment and starting to produce your alcohol. It's not as simple as that. Even if you were not going to go into all the peripheral income streams and tours and tastings, if that does not form part of your business plan, and it doesn't have to, uh, we recommend it, but it doesn't have to. Even if you don't incorporate those aspects, there's still a lot to consider in terms of your distillery. So in this chapter, we're going to explore um, those different facets, the things that you have to keep in mind. We're going to look at different types of equipment. We're going to look at the production flows and so forth um, and just kind of get you get your ideas running, get your uh, blood pumping um, to inspire you to a certain extent, but also to open your mind to the other possibilities, but also to the challenges involved. Is This is going to help you when you're looking at premises, when you're looking at buildings um, to buy or to rent and so forth. It'll help you kind of narrow down what is required and what's not required. You can also use this information, of course, if you're using an agent to go scouting for you for properties and so on, to brief them as to what your requirements would be. Now, basically, we're going to uh, break this chapter down into four lessons, each focusing on a different set of factors which you need to consider. Now, these are some of there is some overlap. Um, between uh, different factors they kind of they do influence one another but I've tried as much as I can to separate them into unique subject matter so the first lesson is going to be regarding space factors in terms of your area in terms of the space that you're utilizing um, in terms of the layout and so forth what do you need to keep in mind um, here we're going to look at production flow specifically as well as production areas. Now the production flow, without going into too much detail, anybody who's ever worked in manufacturing or for that matter who followed a recipe in a kitchen would know that there is a certain order in which things need to happen. There's an order to production. And the moment you upscale that when you're going on a commercial style, there is a there has to be a design in place to allow for this flow, to allow for the movement of equipment, to allow for the, or not equipment, but raw materials, to allow for um, the ability to work without cross-contamination. For instance, if you're working off grain, if you're making your fermentation, obviously that can be a lot of dust, it can be particulate matter uh, being blown up or thrown around or... Um, messing around the place. You don't want that happening close to your final dilution tank, for instance, because if you contaminate that, your final spirits is going to go into the bottle, you're going to get sedimentation in the bottles, you're going to get haziness in the bottles. So there's things like that that we're going to be considering and talking about when we look at the production flow. The production areas are firstly practical areas, as I mentioned now, clean areas versus dirty areas, there's safety areas, flammable areas versus non-flammable areas, and then there's also the legal areas, VMP, VMS, and bonded warehouse, which you've already now understood, you know what that's about, so I don't have to explain it again, but we're going to see how does those areas affect your layout and affect your design. What do you need to keep in mind in terms of area delineation and so forth, in terms of the actual setup? Then we're going to move on to the next lesson where we're going to look at practical factors. Now the practical factors, as the name implies, is the actual work that needs to be done. Now in order to do this work, you obviously need um, equipment. And we're going to look at all the different equipment and all the different categories of equipment. We're going to break it down into a, cons uh, a logical manner as to the categories of equipment. There's a, the exact same categorization we use as well. Um, both in terms of our website, you'll, you'll be able to find the equipment very easily on the website because 
uh, we use the same categories, and but the website categories is based on the way we do quotes and the way we do designs. So there's method to madness, although it might not always look like it, there's method to madness in everything that we do. So when you receive a quote from us, that quote will be broken up into the different equipment for the different activities within your distillery, and we're going to discuss it now in exactly the same way, so that you have an idea of what's going to be happening, what type of equipment that, uh, uh, are you going to need. You'll understand the difference, hopefully, between direct boilers and indirect boilers or jacketed boilers. So we're going to discuss a couple of options there that can, will probably take a while, but it's knowledge that you need to understand. Why, why is it that we recommend certain equipment and why is it you won't need other types of equipment? We'll also look at some, I don't want to, I want to use the word shortcuts, but if you're working on a tight budget, then we need to make a plan. We need to look at alternatives, so we'll look at and discuss some of those alternatives as well. Things that you can do as an interim measure to save a little bit of a, a setup cost in the beginning. Because what a lot of people, the mistake that they make is when they look at their budget, they only look at the capex, they only look at the equipment cost, and they completely forget about the opex, the operational expenditures. If you, if I'm going to quote you on a distillery that's going to cost you 600,000 rand, you can't budget 600 or 700,000. You need to budget at least 1.2 million. That's a fact. The, my, I always tell clients, take your capex budget and double it. Then you know you've, you've sorted. Then you will be in, have enough for your operational expenditures, for marketing expenditures, for licensing and so forth. You should be enough uh, or should have enough if you double your OPEX uh, budget. In terms of infrastructure, distillery infrastructure, there we're going to be discussing things like your water, your services, your uh, drainage, your electricity, uh, power sources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All those services that has to be in place in order to support the equipment. Then we're going to look, talk about income factors. Now, income factors, we're going to discuss peripheral income streams, other things you can do inside your distillery, um, and how they affect design specifically. Some of it won't have that much of an effect. Um, I mean, if we're talking merchandising, for instance, you just need to put some shelving or racks in, uh, up in your tasting room, and then you can that will allow for merchandising to take place. Um, so. It's not necessary, not all the issues will necessarily impact on design. The big ones that will impact on design we'll obviously discuss at length. The others I'm just going to quickly touch on because this is a good place to discuss them. Um, don't want to spend too much time on them discussing it in the business plan section. Uh, it's just, again, a way to get you thinking about what's possible, uh, what alternatives are there, how can I add income to my business setup. And then space utilization kind of also falls into uh, peripheral income streams. But it's the reason why I handle it separately. It comes down to the fact that if you can go bigger in terms of your building, you should go bigger because it allows for future expansion, but it also allows you to do other things, to pop in another business, to, to rent that space out on a on an event basis or a function basis and so forth. So we'll just look very quickly, not in depth, just very quickly look at some of the things you can actually do if you have slightly more space um, available. Now, you might have noticed the videos playing around on the background. Um, what we tend to do, or what I tend to do when we do a class in-house is during breaks and so forth, uh, tea breaks and lunch breaks and so on, I'll put some videos on for the guys to watch kind of as an inspiration um, distilleries that I personally like, um, things that I found interesting uh, that portrays a certain style or a look or a feel just to kind of inspire them. Now obviously that's a bit difficult with the online but what I will be doing is I will be uploading these videos as well for you to download and watch uh, yourself just to kind of as I say inspire you. Uh, one of the very inspiring videos is this one over here from Shelter Point Distillery. Um, it's a great example of a field to flask or farm to bottle style distillery. But in terms of what we're going to be discussing in this section is the marketing factors that apply in, or how marketing factors affect your distillery design. And here we're going to look at things like ambience, what, what feeling, again, this relates to brand identity now. If somebody walks into your distillery, what do you want them to experience? What is the, the look and the feel that you want? What kind of mindset do you want to create inside your distillery? Are you going to be the, um, the farm to bottle type setup? 
or are you going to be very scientific and clinical and modern and neat? Are you going to be urban um, with stainless steel and raw concrete and iron? Are you going to be f um, fantastical, myst mystical, um, uh, made up? We're going to, I'm going to show you examples of that because it, that happens. Um, I can think of at least off the top of my head five distilleries internationally that have this completely made up fantastical image when you walk in there. The one is circus fiend, the other one is literally called Lost Spirits. That's the one I'm going to use in as, as an example where it's like walking into the set of the Indiana Jones movie. It's the, They've created this place where people can escape and uh, live out this fantasy all built around the spirit product that they make. So that's going to be ambience. And then lastly, we're going to look at story and location. How does your story, how does your physical location impact on your design what what do you need to keep in mind what can you keep in mind and so forth now before we get started in discussing all of this in our um, w2 class our grain based spirits class or the w2 section of the c10 comprehensive distilling class there was one lesson that was about the use of multiple stills in a commercial distillery um, that was explaining why we have stripping runs followed by rectifying runs followed by uh, ginning runs, for instance, and you have three different stills doing those three different um, jobs. We also discussed in that lesson a quick costing um, and scaling, uh, the phased approach that we use when we buy equipment and design a distillery as well. That was all discussed in that lesson. So for those of you that's already done C10 or you've done the W2 grain based spirits course, you can skip the next video because I'm going to put that lesson in this course as well. Just kind of to remind you and for those of you that have not done that course yet, just so that you can understand what, um, what we're talking about when we're talking about stripping runs and rectifying runs and ginning runs, if we talk about multiple stools, so you can understand why we do it and how we do that. So if you've already done those courses and if you've done it recently, you can just skip the next video. It's not a prerequisite, so you can skip it. If you've done it a while ago and you can't forget it or can't remember it, please um, watch the video again. And obviously, if you have not done any of that training, it is highly recommended that you do watch the next video so that you can understand what we're talking about uh, because I'm not really going to explain it in detail again in the future course material. So it is my recommendation that you then watch that. So let's move on to using multiple stills in a commercial distillery.